Okay, punters, here we are for uh, punning Melbourne style. I'm joined by Rexy, great long term Once. subscriber of uh, mine and uh, Ralphie's. Rexy's a um, uh, terrific punter who's very good at finding the best price and um, he's uninhibited by uh, having spent hours and hours doing the form because he outsources that, as I said, to me and Ralphie and people like Howard Walter and other form analysts. He just gets the information, knows very well how to use it, and then goes about finding the best prices and uh, maximising the, uh, the advantages of that information. So anyway, now last Friday just had so happened that Rex had the opportunity to come out with me and um, walk the track and I just thought it would be interesting for the punters for us to sort of talk through that, some of the conversations we had while we were doing it, how it affected the, the betting on the day, how you approached it and um, so forth. I mean, and, and, you know, it's worth pointing out that we, we had a bit of a day out there on Saturday, Rex, everything fell in the place for us. It was a very good day for me and my subscribers and uh, it was happy all around. And thanks to all those people that have uh, got in contact with me subsequent to the meeting on Saturday that had a lot of fun. It was very fun seeing the emails rolling because some of them come in immediately after the meeting and some of them come in in dribs and drabs after that, with the latest one being about 3.30 a.m. So, so some of them- <laughs> Someone's had a good night. Some of them went out and enjoyed themselves. So good on them, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a very good day. So, um, and Potts did say in the video that we were doing the track walk at 12.30, which is the middle of my working day. It was actually 6.30 in the morning, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was 6.30 in the morning. Before of course work. It was. Yeah, of course it was. It's an odd mistake to have said that. I don't know what's wrong with me. So anyway, as we, as we're walking around there on um, on Friday, Rex, I remember we got the 600 metre mark and I'd walked the track the day before and not much had changed. You know, I was actually expecting that we're going to have a bit of rain, that's why we organised to go out there the, the next day. And um, I just said, to you, I, I, I've got to be honest, man, I can't remember seeing a better set of circumstances for on paces at Caulfield in an awful long time. And that really resonated with me. I'm sure those of you who watched the video and also the subscribers who got the email, to hear that over and over again, to hear it, and to read it in the email, to play back the video, to actually hear you mention it probably as we walked the second round about the track, it's a, what is it, it's a half hour, 45 minute walk, yeah. um, to hear it over and over again, I just thought, geez, there've been some really, far, you know, biased, in inverted commas, tracks at Caulfield over the last three or four years, there's been some absolute doozies, and to hear Pot say that this was probably the one of the most pronounced biases, I use that in inverted commas again, really made me have a good look at, I'll probably increase the bets on some of the horses that were going to be in the first three or four. Yeah. Um, took some prices during the day that were on those horses that were going to be favoured. Once the pattern was clearly established after one or two, three races that just reinforced what you'd said, it, you know, it was a real opportunity to fill up on Saturday. Yeah, it wasn't, it's hard, it wasn't really so much bias, it was just that it was a good set of circumstances for leaders. They were going to occupy the positions that were going to dominate the race. and. It was going to be extremely difficult for horses to pull wide and circle the field. Now, um, people can go and look at it. Anything wider than lane six on Saturday, the only place getters were Dorverton, and there might have been one other. Ah, yes, um, Robert Smerton's horse that ran second to Qualista. Um, the answer, my friend. It, it probably got out to lane six and maybe. But it was still wide. in the. It was in the first five. Yeah, it was. It was up the whole yeah, way. Absolutely. But I, so that, that's why I thought it'd be really good front paces because. The I thought the fields would be more compact than they actually were, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, subject in a moment. And I, I sort of what I did know that pulling wide which wouldn't be effective because there was damage out there that they just wouldn't get the traction. Um, so anyway, one of the interesting things we went to the pub after we walked the track, and we were talking about race one, and, and I marked um, Hell High Water uh, eleven to four, three dollars eighty for the, uh, our younger viewers, and. I'd said on the, in the interim sort of Friday, we'll have some some of your bet at the 480. And we'll, Rexy and I were talking about it because Rexy had his dynamic up deciding, you know, how if you're going to take that or not. And I, and I said, look, to be quite honest, I really don't know that it's going to not start longer than that because the pattern's not going to be established. I'm certain in my mind that it's a genuine 11 to 4 chance, but I wouldn't be surprised if they trade longer. And uh, that's what happened. She got out to. Seven dollars right on the death. Yeah, seven, or even mid sevens on the fair. And there we go. So, um, is that a good time to talk about? Yeah, uh, it is, the it is. SP, it's how good. it works. Yes, I was quite annoyed because I'd had. Uh, look, I took some of the four eighty on Friday, probably half the bet that was going to end up being, but then took some more um, starting price guarantee after nine o'clock on Saturday morning, 
and I've worked out it's definitely seven dollars starting price because I haven't done any calls. Yeah. I got ten bookies up. It used to be thirteen or fourteen, but you know, three or four corporates have pulled out of Dynamic now. So I've got virtually every bookie that's on Dynamic up on the screen. There's ten boards. Seven of them are seven dollars at the jump, and the SP comes out at six fifty. So when you've had four hundred on it, mm. that's uh, you know that's cost me two hundred bucks. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I write to Dynamic. I know it's not Dynamics. Dynamic just put the price out. It's not their policy. Yeah. The policy comes from Racing Australia, I think. And this, the, the price has to be on the board for 40 seconds to, to be considered a fluctuation or an SP. So uh, Carl from Dynamic was kind enough to write back to me and said that with 40 seconds to go, there would have only been five or six boards betting $7. And obviously between the 40 second mark and the jump, it's a couple of boards have gone out to $7. So I reckon they're splitting hairs there because mm. it, had, it had actually top flux $7. So at some point with about a minute to go or a minute and a half to go, there were enough boards to I'm put sorry, out a top flux at $7. I'm sorry to Carl and whoever wrote that policy, but like turn it up. It started $7 with almost all the corporates. Yep. There was one or two that were six fifty. Yep. Nearly all of them were seven dollars. So how, if, if hiding behind your policy here is not good enough, your policy's wrong. If that horse started seven dollars, and the official price that was put out was in error. Yep. So, and I've, actually, I've gone back to Carl. I haven't got an answer yet, but I asked, well, what if the reverse happened? If it was seven dollars on every board with forty seconds to go, and then between the thirty-second mark and the start of the race, there was a massive plunge, and it came in to five dollars. Would because the five dollars hadn't been there for forty seconds or more, would the SP go out at seven dollars, or would the SP go out at five dollars? I haven't heard back yet, no. but I, I bet mm. that the SP goes out at five dollars in a case like that. Yeah, it's um, mm. so it's wrong. Yeah. I, I'm not going to. I'm not blowing with dynamic odds. That's the, the, it's not their policy. They just uh, implement the policy. So it's Racing Australia. But maybe, if you go, maybe, so if any someone from Racing Australia now goes and clicks on Saturday's race meeting and brings up dynamic, it'll have the final prices for every yep. corporate will all be seven dollars it's there for everyone to see yeah. it's there for history for forever so maybe richard irvine and a few of those mm. um what can we call them advocates lobbyists yes. can can take a case up look it doesn't have, look sp back in the 30s and 40s was massive yeah and, you know most people bet sp um even 15 years ago before the corporates there was a lot of sly sp betting yeah. going on but today it's pretty small but for those people who are taking SPG, yeah, it, you know, can can turn around, you know, it can make a difference of a few hundred dollars. Well, it's SPG and it's best tote because most of the best totes on Saturday have best tote plus SP. Yes, yeah. true. Yeah. I, I don't use that product, but you're right. That's um, best of three plus or tote yeah. plus, whatever they call it. Yep, yeah. correct. Anyway, so um, on the race two, which is a pretty uh, boring race, but this is an interesting one because it was part of our track walking. I can say to my subscribers, this horse would not have been on the betting plan. And Rexy and I had this conversation walking around the track on Friday. Um, we, we got a bit further after I said this is a good set of circumstances for the on paces. We're up around the 400 metre mark and we stopped at an area on the home turn where there was quite a lot of fill and it was from, it was from the inside rail right out and it was spread everywhere. So there was no way of avoiding it. All the horses had to go through it no matter what lane they were in. And I suspect some of the easing off the rail on the point of the home turn was due to that Phil, but I don't see the point. That wasn't going to help many. Anyway, um, and we, while we were stopped there talking, I said, Rexy, the, the problem I have is when I walk these tracks and I see this little circumstance, I, I just haven't, because I've only been doing it 18 months, and if, sometimes I've seen things like this and haven't gone hard enough. And I said, um, there was a meeting recently at Sandown where I thought there was going to be a real advantage racing in the front third of the field, but I just didn't get enough of those horses on the betting plan. And the, like the first, and the, what, if I had had one or two more horses to each race, we would have backed on every winner, and we had, actually had a losing day, and I was very frustrated about it. And I said, I'm not going to make that mistake with this meeting. And I'll give you a perfect example. In Sullivan Bay, I, when I look at the ratings of the race, I feel like she's just going to run an honest race, and she'll probably get beaten by a couple of horses and run, you know, in the placings, maybe fourth, but get beaten. But this is such a good circumstance for a horse like her, she'll definitely be going on the betting plant now. The problem is I only managed to put it on with one unit, which was going to make it a, you know, a very small uh, winning race. But then as it got closer to the race myself, I bumped that up a little bit. But I think I think every punter that walked the track with pots on on Friday 
doubled that bet. <laughs> <laughs> Took the maximum allowed on the SPG product, yeah. thinking that, that obviously the resonating in my ears was from the day before that you reckon Salon Bay is really, really advantaged by the conditions, and she's um, she's done it at Caulfields quite a few times before. So she's very honest. And last night she was exposed to the wind, and every face sort of you know treated the beat up, and. Yeah, well, I think on form she was probably a 10 to 1 chance, but she actually started $7. So that tells me that the big teams were already starting to jerry by race two. And then at, not long after that, we started to see in the later races, the upcoming races, all the mm. on-pace runners start to shorten. Yeah, I, was, I just started flicking up and back through um, Dynamic, just checking every race, and I could see that you know, the Smarties were out there chipping away at the... You know, like Oscar's my mate Parr, he was nineteen dollars and he came into eleven over the course of the afternoon and there are a number of other runners that came in simply because they were gonna be in the first four. So yeah, it didn't take long and he took two two races and yeah. I mean we were obviously forewarned and and forearmed and um, were ready to go. Uh, but a lot of them we'd already backed anyway, they were already yeah. on the betting plan. But I put a few a, a handful more into the betting plan. Yeah. Um, based on us getting it franked in the first couple of races. Yep, so we'll move through the rest pretty quickly. So race three was Callista. Um, I think it was a huge advantage for her to have Daniki scratched at the gates. Um, there she was. The only problem was she didn't parade very well. I think she's got a lot of improvement with that horse. Uh, you know, if I, she'd have paraded better, I would have really got stuck into her, but I sort of didn't. But um, you know, she just went to the front and dominated the race. So, yeah, I'm lucky I don't I don't get any parade information. I don't watch the parades. I turn on racing.com when there's 30 seconds to go. So I don't listen to any of that yeah. nonsense that you normally hear on there and trainers interviews and all that stuff. I'm not interested. So occasionally it'd cost me. There'd be good information coming from the mounting yard um, about how a horse parades and I'd be wish I'd heard it, but in this case I'm glad I hadn't. You know, when when Danuki got scratched, I'd Put another two units on key lister because quickly looking at the map that you'd put out you know to all the pot subscribers the map it just looked an absolute key lister benefit once Danuki came out or at least it improved its chances yeah. and even though i knew there'd be a, a small deduction it was you know, in, in hindsight 550 was a particularly good price i mean you know she was a western australian man hard to line up exactly but you know she seemed to have an advantage on the field there going to darren weir she just, you know, you could run that race a lot of times and she'd just win it every time, so. Aren't the Western Australian horses going well? They are. It's yeah. just a procession of them now. It's year after year they come over and it's, it's, it's like us Australian horses going to the UK and to the Hong Kong for the sprint races. We, when we do send them, we tend to dominate. It's almost like the same pattern. Yeah, there's, um, what's the name of that horse at um, the old tree? His name's Smith. I can't think of his first name now. Stan, is it Stan Smith? He's uh, the horse that um, Douglas White dropped his hands on or whatever and just got nailed in the, in the group one in Perth. Scales of Justice? Yeah, that's it. Scales of Justice. I'm sure that's, that's it. He's a very interesting horse. I'll, and he's over here. So he's coming. Yeah. He's here. So, um, yeah, interesting. Now, those group ones in Perth are rock solid. They never used to be, but yeah. they are now. Yeah, you're watching for him. So on the, on the day at Confidence, there were seven on pace winners and two that weren't directly on pace. Rhythm Despair was one of them. Now he was one pair further back than what I call the on pace group. Mm -hmm. He was virtually part of it. And Brandon Stockdale learned from his ride on Dorvaldin in race one where he pulled wide and wasn't able to make up the ground. I mean, her run was outstanding, but and on Rhythm Despair, he could have come wide, but he decided to cut the corner on that one in the race. So. Well done to uh, Brandon there, great ride. Bit of a bunch finish, but it was lanes one, two, three, and four that uh, dominated the race, and there's not a lot to say there. In four, eight year old flying won the race. Yeah, four of them close across the track. Um, look, I'd had, a, I'd had a pretty decent bet, Jack and Obey the place. Something went wrong with one of the corporates on Saturday, and they were winding in the win prices, but the, the place prices were stuck. Oh, right. So uh, I went back four times. In the end, I've been missed out by a sh short half end, but by a horse you had on the betting plan, um, you know, moving Manhattan, Manhattan yeah. for the play. So, if that foundry had it just pissed <laughs> off, I would have that would have been an absolute bonanza. Wow! There was a couple of a couple of races during the day where uh, Lux bet just the, the place price froze, and they were betting three sixty five, and everyone else was two forty. Wow! And I just sort of kept going back hundred, 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 hundred. So. Uh, Lost 400 on it, but mm. um, 
yes, those those occasional little opportunities, you just don't let them go by. Absolutely, I thought it was a real good chance, and mm. it's, it was the most of the inside. It was the inside right against the rails, came up there all the way. So there's nothing. I mean, here there, here to there showed. There's nothing wrong with coming up there. Lane one actually provided as many place getters on Saturday as any other lane. Heater there was the only winner, but there were a number of long price place getters that were in lane one. They yeah, did... and probably because they were coming from back in the field as well. So Jack and Obey. Either was... that or leading. So it was one or the other. Yeah, well right? Jack and Obey had to come yeah. had to make up the ground on the three place yeah. getters and wasn't disadvantaged by the fact that it was on the rails, but just they had to give that head start was the difference. So uh, petite, whatever it's called, uh, Brenda McCarthy's filly, mm -hmm. she was one. Um, yeah, there was a few, I can't remember all. Anyway, um, moving on to race five, that was uh, Crown Witness. Now, this, I actually left this race off the betting plans. I didn't really want to take Catchy on, but after I'd sent it out, I haven't had a look at the market and thought, oh, I'll have a small bet on Crown Witness. And at that stage, it was must have been 10 o'clock, it was 8.50. I think I only had 200, well, it was nothing. And um, that was it for the race. And so I didn't pay attention to that mark. I didn't even look at the rest of the day. By the time we get to this race, I look, $4. That's amazing. Yeah. They go across the line, $3.10. Across all the totes. 310, seriously. 310. So I'm saying. Jeez, the 850 was luxury. Jelko's team um, marked this horse 2 to 1, and they just kept taking, you know, that was it. So And that's how it played out. I mean, mm. Catchy, was, uh, Catchy was pretty knackered on the line. I don't reckon it would have got it another 50 metres, it was making ground and then just grinded that last little bit. We just showed that the price assessments by the market was spot on. So when you walk that track, it was lanes one, two, three, four, pristine. Lane five was still good, but you didn't have to go much further to fall off the cliff. Yeah. Patchy just was borderline. She, and I think that, you know, in the end, having to make up ground in those circumstances and pulling into that fringe lane just made the difference. And she's, the other horses, a fit, rock solid, nice, nice filly, you know, racing well. You're going to have to beat her and catch his first up. So you know, a lot of credit to catch you there. We didn't make this point in race one, but hell of high water in the first. But basically, the whole field came out came virtually in. off the good lanes. Yeah, and she hung stayed, back she hung back in. She was staggering a bit and looked like she'd get picked up by a couple. But she hung back in, definitely onto the good lane, and she started drawing away that last 50 metres. Yep. She was pulling away from all of those horses. So I reckon there was, a few, there was a few strides where she might have got out to lane five, five and a half, and then she yeah. started to hang back in. As soon as she got to lane three, then she got a gap on them again yeah. with the neck. Um, jukebox next race. So this is a race that, um, the only race that we betted on today that we didn't win on. Uh, I thought he was a bit short. Um, he's, but I've got to give him a lot of credit. This horse, he's a very determined racehorse, and he got he got the job done. You know, he had, had things against him. That Hayes horse had, um, you know, a fair gap on him, and he did a good job to run it down. So, um, yeah, well, Ralphie's subscribers yeah. were on plutocracy. Oh, were they? Being well, one of them myself, yeah. and he had traded in the mid twenties yeah, right. on, on the Betfair. So, uh, look, I had plutocracy going for the national debt in the end. Just a just a little fun bet, mm. um, some SPG, and then some big odds on. On uh, Betfair, but I was at my son's basketball match then, and it had know. had a previous clash with Kobayashi where Plutocracy started five to four, I think, and um, Kobayashi started about seven or eight dollars. So that was interesting. That in this race, yeah, it was Kobayashi, you know, second favourite, and uh, Plutocracy was despised. It's um, I would have been annoyed with myself if it had a one because I probably should have found it. Um, the, that the figures there. Are, the, the interesting part about the uh, four 1100 metre races there today is uh, Sullivan Bays were in clearly the better figures. So, just, I mean, all them horses were just getting started, so um, we won't worry about them too much, but there's nothing outstanding there in those 1100 metre races, particularly if you compare it to race eight, which was Vega Magic. And if punters want to know the difference between genuine group one horses and sort of listed and open handicap type horses, there it is in that race. There's two group one horses in that race. Yep. And there they are, four and a half lengths of the rest that were but trying their guts out, and they've run very fast time. So and the market found them, and the, yeah. the corporates, the the guys who do the, <coughs> the markets on Wednesday, and they all they copy and paste. There's just, there's just no way that it can be an analyst or a team of analysts at every corporate book in Australia, and they've all come up with five dollars value of magic. I mean, it's just absurd. So they're copy and pasting. Yeah. 
which is to our benefit in a case like this, where you're able to get a lot of lot of money on at five dollars yep. on Friday when pot set came out. Even Saturday morning, there's still 480, 460 most of the morning, and then it just kept shortening and shortening and shortening. Well, you remind me about some of the conversations we had. So when we were, uh, you know, walking up the home straight before we did the video, I said the horse that really jumped out at me in my erection with these circumstances is Vega Magic. I can't believe they're betting five dollars. I can't imagine it'll possibly start that. And Brave Smash will need to be a good horse to um, maintain its position in the market here. And I'm a little bit concerned, just hearing some of the things Darren Weir had said, that he might take it out and we're going to cop a big deduction. So I can't wait till 9 o'clock to tick over so I can back this horse knowing what the final field is. Um, now, when you fast forward to the race, Vega Magic's gone around 280 and the other one's continued to shorten, which just says these are two very good horses and they are. So there, there we go. But I was delighted that they um, they were willing to bet us $5. It was a... Yeah, it was a bit of a, it was a, bit of a fill up. And then the, the other, if you could get 420, um, the other horse, um, yep. mid-afternoon, about three o'clock, because the money for Vega Magic kept coming, kept yep. coming. So um, the Weir horse got out to 420. So that's when I had some SPG on that at 420. And so, come to race time it was just a luxurious position to be in and a like a painless last 200 meters just didn't have space the rest yeah extraordinary well ralphie's turned up so we'll um why don't we just stop this bit here and then we'll come back and we'll do the, the part two with ralphie